Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mickey, DZ8397. And I'm Marcus, TK14057. And we're your hosts for this segment of the 501st Legion's program 1138, celebrating 50 years of Lucasfilm. And we're joined by Kim Smith and John Goodson. Both Kim and John have worked as model makers for Industrial Lights and Magic, also known as ILM. And just a small sampling of some of the films uh, that one or both of them have worked on over the years are Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Star Trek, The Undiscovered Country, Galaxy Quest, Pirates of the Caribbean, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and of course, the Star Wars prequel trilogy. So welcome to our program, Kim and John. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. So did you both join ION at about the same time? And what were your first projects you guys worked on? Body Wars, and we did we did uh, arrive at the same time in 88. We arrived within a month or two of each other. John had done some a little bit of work, very short work uh, a couple of years earlier, sort of as a- I wasn't paid. I was here, I had a friend I went to high school with, a guy named Tony Hudson, who had gotten a job at the Creature Shop. And I came out to visit Tony for five weeks and lived on his couch. <laughs> and they were doing the whales for Star Trek Four. So they're animatronic whales. They were four feet long. And so I was hanging out with those guys. And we went and did a location shoot up in San Mateo in a high school pool. And I wasn't, get, I wasn't an employee, but I was doing the video playback for them and just getting to hang out, which was really cool. So. Yeah, so our first formal formal job at ILM was, was Body Wars, which was for uh, Disney's Epcot Center. Okay. Yeah, it was a lot like Star Tours, except you get miniaturized and you go through the human body. Mm -hmm. and it was one of Elizabeth Shue's first acting roles, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on a giant heart. Yeah, we had different people working on different parts of the body, a huge, you know, stage of different sets of different body parts, but mine was the heart. <laughs> yeah, or we had a, a birthday party for Harley Just the art director between the two halves of the brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I was curious, um, out of everything you've worked on, what would you find was either your most challenging or your most time intensive uh, prop or scene to work on? Enterprise E. Yeah, I would say the Enterprise E from Star Trek First Contact was just, that was a horror show. It really was. I mean, we got the model done, but it was just that's beautiful. Yeah, but it was so arduous to get there. Mm -hmm. We wound up so behind schedule. Combination of things that you know, for me, building the enterprise, I was the model shop supervisor. It was kind of like going off to find God. Kind of, it was such a big deal to me to build the enterprise, and it was, we just had a lot of problems with it. And they came to do a publicity shoot for it. To do, uh, they're going to put it in the poster. And it's funny, I can tell you to the day from the photographs, because the Enterprise changed shot by shot. It was shot in sequence, which is unusual. But for the post, it didn't have these parts that were in the back of the saucer. There were these little shuttle bays. Well, they were just open. And you could see the neon lights inside of it. And there's a poster for Nick for first contact where the Enterprise is racing away. And you can see inside the model, you can see the neons through these holes that are in the back. <laughs> and we didn't have the sensor dish. And the sensor dish went through some changes because they decided to shoot a big live action sequence on the dish with these Borg. And so they had to build a full size set. Well, we had a very curved, beautiful compound curved area where that all occurred on the miniature. But because they're building a set, it became very planar because that's what sheets of plywood yield. And so we had to go back and cut that section of the Enterprise out with it on stage, mounted on a rig with the camera in there. We had to cut that section out and replace it without moving the model, which was a, that was a challenge. But oh, wow. Yeah, but that whole thing, the project, it came out fine. But like I said, the Enterprise changed from shot to shot. I can I can point out as as the sequence of shots happens of the ship, the things that are changing. <laughs> the engines change, the sensor dish changes, the little docking ports change. It was kind of, yeah, that was a tough one. Typically, of course, we they, they tell us to bring it to 90%, 80%, somewhere mm -hmm. in there when it goes on stage and then you do it to, to shot, you finish it to shot. Um, well, you get it off the construction construction budget, you get it on the aid support budget. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and you know, the big the big thing, of course, is they'll often say they'll never see that. They'll never see with that, which is the uh code for they'll definitely see it because they're gonna change the shot and you're gonna see it. So you better <laughs> check it out. <laughs> 
that ha happens virtually every single time somebody says they'll never see it. And that reminds me of um, another video I had watched, uh, John, that you were on where, you know, you were setting up the Razor Crest and um, they're like, you're trying to ask them, so you're only going to see this part, right? Right. And they're <laughs> like, well, we're going to see that part and this part and this. <laughs> so well, that, that was also complicated, huh? Well, that was because what they did was we, you know, we were in the process, John Knoll was building the motion control camera system and I was working on the model and then they decided suddenly they wanted to, wanted to show a shot at Celebration. And I was like, we don't have a model and he doesn't have a camera. We're a little premature on this. And I, and so we talked about it. And what they initially said was that they, they would do a shot where it's just from the front and you'd see the Razor Crest just rock and roll a little bit. And that would be it. And I'm like, okay, I can build the front and get the engines on there. We can do enough to get that shot. That'll be fine. And John cobbled together parts of the motion control system and he rented a Cooper system to drive it with. But we got it all together enough to to do it. And then they came back with what the shot actually was. And now it's two shots. And now the Razor Crest comes towards you with it banked. It's banking to the left. So it comes towards you. So you see the front, the, the right side, the bottom, and the back as it goes by. And then the next shot is it comes by and it's tilted down. So you see the front, the top, the back. So I said, so you're seeing everything but like the driver's side mirror. <laughs> really we really narrowed this down to something manageable so we we got it done and we shot it but the ship didn't have any weathering or anything at that point and it looked like a mirror which looked really cool mm -hmm. it looked really cool it hadn't <laughs> scale but it looked really cool but those we yeah, got the no, all of us at celebration thought that was really cool so it worked <laughs> <laughs> it worked but it was that was a challenge that was definitely a challenge <laughs> so it's been probably like eight or nine years. Um, uh, John, you were at a convention, and, and Kim, you were there too, um, Northern California, I think in Petaluma. You mentioned that a bunch of you guys went into like a building supply store and picked up things and looked at it at all different angles. And the lady behind the catchers just said, oh, aren't you work for Island, right? Um, so what were one of your favorite finds, I guess, at at those stores or even at flea markets or finding stuff in your garage? Oh gosh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one, one store that we used to frequent a lot up here, which wasn't a hardware store, although we frequent those too, uh, was a um, doll houses and more. And they definitely knew us there because we could get, you know, a lot of little miniature stuff there for free, not for free, obviously, but we didn't have to make it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing about this stuff is, you know, anytime we go someplace, there's a hardware store. Mm -hmm. I like to walk through and just look at everything look because at you just don't know what it is. I mean, I went to a pool supply place and there was mm -hmm. this little floating pool filter thing and it was really, really cool. And so, you know, you never know where those happy accidents will happen where you'll find something that you can just use. And like Kim's saying, instead of having to build it all, if you can find something where you can actually you augment that or it adds to what you're already doing, you know, you're, it puts you that far ahead. And, and it was funny because one of my friends, he had a, he found a Dyson vacuum cleaner and he mm -hmm. tore that thing apart and it's got such great shapes and he's made this kind of engine thing out of it. And it's so cool. It's just a found, but yeah, anytime there's something like that, it's a, whether it's a surplus store or a hardware store or, you know, even Home Depot, just go walk around and see what you see. And, you know, even if you don't use it now, you're kind of in your head, you're like, oh, I remember there was, you know, maybe you can go back and find it. There's a scrapyard called Maselli's that's in Petaluma. And I love Maselli's because they've got, I don't know, two or three acres of just junk. And you can walk around back there. And I had to build a, it was a laser gun. It was a laser, a tripod that was for, I think it was for, oh, what's it called? ILM. It's the unit that does like the VR stuff. I can't remember the name of it right now, but they needed this thing. And they, they called me and I got a call on my phone and they're like, oh, we need it for tomorrow. And I didn't, I didn't respond to the call. I'm like, tomorrow, really? <laughs> then they came to my office and that was like at three o'clock and they said, we have to have this thing. And I'm like, then I have to leave right now. So I borrowed a tripod from the motion or the camera, the motion capture stage downstairs. And I went to Maselli's and for 60 bucks, I bought a lawn chair that would swivel. I bought a, like a little uh, column out of a, like a banister thing that had flutes in it. I bought a piece of right angle aluminum and some tubing. And with that junk overnight by 10 the next morning, I had their laser cannon that they could assemble. The guy said to assemble it, they wanted that action and put it on a tripod. 
but it was, you know, $60 worth of junk from Maselli's and, you know, stuff I had in the garage and overnight, you know, I had a laser cannon tripod thing. We even, uh, we even like health and beauty products. Um, I uh, was saving had little, uh, I wear contact lenses and there was a, a kind of a uh, cleaner cylinder that had a platinum disc in the bottom that had cool shapes. So for a while I was saving those for for us to use, for John to use particularly in, in um, you know, models. Also, he likes to use razor heads. And then I have these little, uh, currently use like one day contents and they come in a little cup that has a great shape. But especially one thing we look for always are cone shapes because cone shapes are harder to make. Mm -hmm. So if you can find something that's like a cone shape and you can make a, a mold out of it and cast it that way, it really helps yeah, to get yeah. pre-made shapes. So I love hardware stores too. I can, I can spend hours and hours in a hardware store. And one of the things Kim was talking about disposable razors. I love them because they're cheap and you get a lot of detail and you can take those and you can make all kinds of stuff out of those. I mean, you just have to be careful. The razor blade part's not exposed where somebody can get it, but mm -hmm. they're beautiful just for their complexity and the low cost and everything. And it was funny because on episode one, Gavin McKay, the production designer, they chose, it was a lady, was it lady? Oh, yeah. A oh, yeah. A little, yeah, a little, I had it. Part. I had it back then. I'm like, okay, I'm saving this. So I'm not using it as a razor anymore. <laughs> well, I saw Gavin. I saw Gavin after the movie. I, went, I walked up and punched him in the shoulder. He goes, what? And I said, it's for user that you could obviously tell was a razor. You guys didn't do enough to kind of change it, you know, but but they're a great foundation for stuff. So anyway. <laughs> but even the handles from the disposable razors can be handy yeah. for detailing on things. Mm -hmm. Anywhere, anywhere. <laughs> any type of store the dollar uh, so, store well, yes, so speaking of uh speaking of anywhere has there has have you like hidden any easter eggs or anything like that or your names or any like thing that only you know about and you know makes you smile when you think about it in any of your props or models that you've done john has i don't think i've ever I, ever done that i put, I put my name and stuff but most on the inside and nobody would ever see that. But I think John will do things that are a little bit more obvious than that. <laughs> on occasion, I mean, my favorite one, it's one I've talked about a lot, was that I was walking, it was at lunchtime one day, and I was walking by, they were shooting part of Naboo, the city. And, you know, they, we had all these buildings that were at about 124th scale. And so they would take these buildings and kind of reconfigure them. And they were in like about a 40 foot by 40 foot block. And they would reconfigure them to be different parts of the city. And I was walking by it and they had all this beautiful topiary stuff and flowers and all the roofs had grass. And I looked at it, I was like, you know, somebody would be mowing the grass all the time out here. So I went back, <laughs> made a little lawnmower, but it's got the grass bag and everything, and a little gas can. And I went back out there and I put it on one of the rooftops and I just walked off and left it. And they shot for about six weeks and those guys kept moving it. And putting it in the shot each time and <laughs> I have yet to ever see it and I've got the lawnmower and the gas can but it was funny because it was just this little thing and for episode two I was going to make a riding mower to put out there and I just never got around to it so <laughs> yeah, but that was my favorite one I think but yeah it's, it's, it's tempting you're, you're bored out of your mind it was funny because the Enterprise E that was funny uh I was at Comic-Con and we were doing a thing talking about starship design and this guy stood up to ask a question. He said, I have a question. He goes, I was working on that for Nemesis, one of the movies where they had done a digital version of it. And they had scanned the Enterprise E model. And he, they found this thing up in the front end on top of the saucer. There, I think there are five large windows that are on this, this horizontal section of it. And if you look down inside, there's actually a dimensional conference room with a little table and chairs and stuff. But on the floor, there's a chalk outline of a body. <laughs> yeah, I said, so I have a question, you know, then we found this thing and there's a chalk outline of a body. What, what was that? And I said, that was me being really bored. I didn't think anybody would find that. And then prop store, prop store had the model it's back. Somebody else uh, has purchased the model and they converted the lighting over from the original incandescent and, and neon over to LED. And they, they also found the room, sent me this picture going, what's up with this? And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll tell you the story, you know, but, but yeah, you know, you're, you work on these things for so long. You get bored with them. You stick stuff on them. And it's funny, on uh, Attack of the Clones, one of the ships, the ship that all the stormtroopers are marching up into, 
I think I was using Mach 3 razors. I don't remember who the manufacturer was. And I put the razor blades on the back of the ship as part of the detail. And then in the film, I'm looking, I'm like, I could see it. It's like, there it is. There's the back of the razor blade. <laughs> Just little things like that. So, anyway. Speaking of organic things, um, I, I read somewhere that <clears throat> you guys were so, you know, used realistic stuff for like the Naboo rooftops. And, and one day, you, somebody mentioned like flowers were moving, um, but actually they were ants, like eating up uh, whatever sweet stuff he put down there to mimic whatever it was. Do you remember that? I don't remember ants. I mean, we did, you know, on, on Mission to Mars, we used um, Nestle's Quick for the surface of Mars. Yeah. But we were only, I think that set was only up for a day and we were up and, you know, we had it up and we shot outdoors and we took it back down. But, and that was an interesting problem because ants. Well, just because they had, I didn't know what I was going to do because we were going to shoot this thing called the Remo. It's a satellite and they've landed on the surface of Mars. They've used this thing as kind of a, an emergency ship to get to Mars. And so they wanted an establishing shot of it laying there and the astronauts walking away. So we were going to have an eight foot by eight foot section of the Mars landscape with the ship on it. And so what we did, we got rubber foam, half inch rubber foam and glued together two sheets. So we had an eight foot by eight foot piece set up two stage tables. And then we could lay this rubber foam on it and Kim matched the color. A guy named Andrew Deskaromney was the art director up in Canada. And he sent me some samples of what they did. They painted a hundred acres in Canada red. And I asked Andrew, I said, is there not an environmental protection agency in Canada? Because I don't think you can paint a hundred acres down here with paint. He goes, yeah, up here you can do that. And X-Files did it. They painted a rock quarry red so it looked like the South, you know? So that was something they did up there. So he had sent me samples. And we're two days before the shoot and I'm laying there laying in bed in the morning thinking about it what am I going to do and my daughter was little so we had Nestle's quick we had chocolate we had straw so I went down and I put a little bit of each in a Ziploc bag took them to work and the chocolate was a perfect match so we got 60 pounds of Nestle's quick Kim painted a bunch of cat litter and some lava rock and the beauty of the and rubber the foam, rubber well, foam the, yeah well, the beauty in the rubber foam and the rubber foam sheet the beauty of that was that we could create topography just by sliding a sandbag under it or anything and we suddenly got a hill we got terrain out of it so we could very quickly adjust the train to camera so that we could get exactly what we wanted. But that combination of the lava rock, the foam being painted, the cat litter, and the Nestle's quick made a really good Mars. But yeah, long term it would be an ant problem for sure. Yeah. So we have we have used uh, very simple stuff uh, for crowd scenes. Is that that was also something that you were thinking of, right? Is that is that one of the things that you were considering? You were wondering if we were using tricks to indicate crowds or uh, crowds in particular. Yeah. Were you asking well, about that? It, it was something else than crowds. It was it was something for the Naboo um, buildings that were that was used on, on the. Well, you know the mice. The mice got into the buildings between episode one and episode two, and okay. they ate a lot of the little little flowers and stuff because mm -hmm. they were. They were Operation. organic, but they had been preserved. But the mice, they, they did a number on the buildings. There was a lot of damage done. So there was a lot of rework that had to be done for episode two. Oh, wow. So they definitely chewed them up between films. Yeah. So. Uh, so is there any, um, I guess, scene or, or something that you built in miniature, um, but then you hear from someone later on who watched the movie and they just flat out would not believe that that wasn't a full scale item? There's some, and have you ever come across that where they're like, no, we don't believe you. That had to have been full size. Well, it was funny on season two Mandalorian, Moff Gideon's cruiser. It was interesting to watch the debate about whether that was a miniature or a digital model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because they wouldn't confirm it for quite a while. They wouldn't confirm that. So it was interesting to watch that kind of being ping ponged around on, you know, on YouTube and whatnot. Uh -huh. So and then they finally came out and yes, it was a miniature, but it's a, it's a combination of CG and miniature. Right. But I yeah. Of course, you know, if, if something is slightly smaller than, than it is in real life, it's still a... And so Pirates of the Caribbean, we, we, made, um, we made the Interceptor, the version that we had at, at ILM was, I think it was 28 feet long or something. So it was a very big minute, but it looked like the real thing. It absolutely did. I don't know... If anybody be confused <laughs> um i mean i think they just assumed that it was the real thing and they did have some full size versions of it um and they uh you know in the caribbean 
but uh, we the, the one that we made was looked very very convincing on on screen. It's yeah. funny. I remember the shot of, of the black pearl lying on the beach. I think in the second movie, it's lying on the shore and it's kind of on its side. And it was interesting because we used to have we used to have backlit blue screens. That was a, a kind of a thing you had to have. And the really big blue screen was probably it was probably over twenty feet tall and it was probably about twenty feet wide. And it was a big metal box, and inside of it had fluorescent tubes. But the thing with the fluorescent tubes, they had to convert them from alternating current to direct current because AC has the flicker in it and DC is constant. And that flicker would have shown up in motion control. So those blue screens, they were a big deal and they had, it had fans and all kinds of stuff in it. It was a huge piece of technology. But around the time of Pirates 2, that wasn't necessary anymore. And they decided to scrap that blue screen. So they cutted it and they took the big metal box and they laid it on its face so that now it's a box that's about three feet tall. And we covered that whole thing in sand and put the black pearl up on top of it. And so wow. that's that in shot, that's a shot of the black pearl on the beach as it's sitting on, that was the last job the blue screen did was to be the beach for that <laughs> shot. Oh, kind of a sad end, but. Not quite its initial purpose, but it's still got a job to do. It still was in show business. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember once being asked to do a to try to trick out the Enterprise E, a very small section of the Enterprise E, for people, so that it would look like little, they would composite little people on to be walking around on on the surface, and it was it was a really pretty much impossible. But I I got really far with it. It actually took me a couple days, believe it or not. But it meant that I had to wear goggles and goggles and goggles. And I had to, to carefully dust or scrape the surface to get rid of, I mean, a, a, the tiniest bit of paint would look like a boulder through the camera. Wow. It was interesting that they even wanted to try to do this and it was sort of flattering that they thought I, I could do it. We'd run out of budget. We were gonna build a big scale model of that. We didn't have the money for it. So that was the fix. But, you know, and that's the shot where there are three of the, Enterprise crew magnetized their space boots and they're walking on the underside of the saucer. And you're wearing, they weren't just goggles, you're wearing magnifiers. Yeah, I was wearing magnifiers and uh, magnifiers on top of magnifiers it was, to, to do that. And it was, it was pretty stressful. After that, I actually had to wear readers of a much higher <laughs> magnification <laughs> than prior to that. And I think ultimately they did have to do either, I, I don't know if they fully replaced it with CG, but they, they, um, they did some work to it to make it, you know, make it believable as full size. But I swear the, the size of the area that I was supposed to do, I think it was like this. It was very right? small. It was 15 inches by 15 inches or something. And to make that look real on, you know, a 4K screen, or maybe it was 2K at the time, I don't know. That was, I mean, I thought, yeah, they really must think a lot of me think that I can do this. So we did get pretty far with it. I have to say it looked reasonable, but not probably quite as good as we wanted it to. So I think they did some enhancements to it. It actually is in the, uh, it's the Wikipedia, it's the, what's the Star, Star Trek Wikipedia or something like that. They, they did a story on it. Somebody wrote something about, about that effort. Okay. Which was pretty cool. <clears throat> Were there any concepts that you came up with that you were really proud of or models that you were working on that just didn't quite make it into the final onto the screen and you were disappointed about it? I can't remember anything. I, I, I was actually proud of everything. <laughs> well, we did a lot of, there's a lot of concept work done on the prequels and not all of that stuff made it to the screen, you know, because there was oh, so concept. much of it. Yeah, that's true. Um, and there was one concept ship that I designed. Well, George talked about a sailing ship, kind of like a, some kind of a like a like a glider almost with long wings. And I came up with a design while I was on the East Coast in the middle of the night. I was back east for Christmas, and I came up with this idea. And then I came back to work, and I made on lunch break. I made this model of it. It's like you know, ten inches tall. And the thing that was really interesting was for a while it wound up in storyboards and looked like it was going to get used. But the thing that fascinated me was George saw that he'd never seen it before. Mm -hmm. And for about three minutes, he talked about how it would all work. And that blew me away that right off the cuff with no, no, nothing cold, he looks at it 
and he can tell you all this. He's, he's envisioned of the, me the mechanical part of this thing. And the first study model I did for the pre was uh, the it was the first version of Anakin's pod racer. And it's not what it ultimately was, but it was two 747 engines with the skins pulled off. And then this little kind of a, it's almost like a beetle shape little pod that, you know, the seat that he was in. But I made the model for it. And the last, you know, that was one of those things where I was up all night long because I did it like in a week. And the last night was a 24 hour night, you know, got it done, drove it up to the ranch and I gave it to Doug and George was going to be coming in shortly. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to go home. And Doug's like, no, you have to stay and meet George. And I'm like, really, I'm going to drop dead. I mean, I really want to go home. He's like, no, you got to stay, you got to stay. So George comes in, meet George. And then George talked about the pod race for about 15 minutes. And you would have sworn that he was at Sears Point yesterday watching the pod race. The way he described this, it was real. And that was absolutely fascinating. And that was something that just kind of blew me away over all the time working at the ranch that he would do that periodically where he would just, he'd talk about it like it was something real. You know, it was really something that, that was always really impressive. To me. And, you know, and we did a lot of stuff. There was a ton of stuff that was designed that didn't make it to the films. But the other thing is interesting is Doug used to keep this wall in his office, Doug Chang, and it was called the wall of shame, which it should not have been, but it, all the things that were rejected, all these drawings and George would remember them. You know, we might be on episode two or three and he'd go, what about the speeder from blah, blah, blah. And they'd go take it down. And, it, and suddenly it was a viable design again. And some of them wound up in the later films. And some things, you know, translate. I think some of the stuff that we did went up in THX when they did the special edition of that, some of the vehicles. So oh. it was really his memory, his ability to just, just take off from these things, look at an image and have all these ideas is just amazing. So anyway, that was just something that really struck me. Yeah, I that's fascinating that he is like on the on the spot yeah. story building right there in front of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so is there any particular model or item that you worked on that you really enjoyed creating or had like a happy memory? Like even if you didn't uh, enjoy creating it at the time, do you have like, was there a happy memory associated with it still anyways? I can, my, my favorite models that I ever worked on were for Hunt for an October. Um, it was a good experience for me, a great experience actually from the very beginning. And it was, I think it was my third project of ILM. And it was just a fluke that I wound up uh, working on the submarines, like resurfacing the submarines. We made some new submarines. We inherited the, the project from Boss Films. And I was tasked with resurfacing and refinishing uh, some of the, the subs that came to us. And then uh, ILM also built some new ones. So I had my, my work cut out for me and um, also babysat the submarines on stage for two months or something. We were shooting out in Richmond, uh, Point Richmond for two months afterwards. But for me, it was my first hand really at doing hard surface painting. I sort of, I come from a, a background that, you know, kind of appreciates everything. My, my dad was an illustrator and he said painting is painting. And uh, typically in our business, people sort of specialize in hard surface or in organic stuff. And I kind of do both. And I don't consider there to be like a difference between them. I enjoy doing both. Anyway, I found out I enjoy doing both because on Red October, I started doing this. And I always, I always say that the ghost of my father was hanging out over my shoulder, you know, pointing out. He got really excited pointing out. <laughs> what I should do with this to the point where I just kind of had to say, you know, dad, just, you know, go sit in the corner for a while or something like that. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it turned out fairly successfully and they were happy with what I was doing. So I wound up sort of being in charge of that. I didn't do all the work myself, but I did the majority of it. Um, um, Baby sat it on stage, but we had a blast on it from the beginning to the end. And the movie was fun. And I found that, that if you enjoy doing the work on the movie, a lot of times the movie is going to be good, like Pirates of the Caribbean or Galaxy Quest or stuff, stuff like that. Yeah, that makes sense. And the, I'm trying to remember exactly what the question was. Was it favorite? 
models. Either, yeah, your favorite prop or like, even if at the time, you know, you were building something, you you weren't happy with it, but then in the end, it still generated a happy memory. I don't know. <laughs> wow, that was Enterprise E. Yeah, Enterprise E, but you know, Rocketeer was a lot of fun. That was, that was yeah. really cool stuff. That was a That's cool time so period cool. <laughs> and a really great look. And, you know, and it was, and it, there were some interesting stories that went along with that. Really but it interesting. Just, that was a fun one. Galaxy Quest was really fun because I, for Galaxy Quest, I got to do concept design. I just drew mostly for about seven months. And it was just, that was a blast. And you draw something and everybody starts building it. And the prequels were kind of that way too, because we build these models. And then, because I was on episode one in the art department for two years. <laughs> and then back at ILM for about a year and a half when we were actually doing the work and people would come with stuff and go, what's this supposed to be? And I'm like, I vaguely remember building that. That was a long time ago, you know. Uh, but yeah, the, the stuff for Mandalorian has been really interesting because you know, I was, we were both in the model shop for about 15, 16 years. And then we both switched over to computer graphics. And so I continued to do practical model work throughout, you know, but it was all kinds of odds and ends things on the side or occasionally for ILM. But coming back now, doing this practical work for Mandalorian is really interesting because it goes back to what I was doing when I first got there. And like the cruiser was really, the cruiser was hard because it was big, but also it was during the pandemic. Mm. All that stuff started happening and it was kind of like, there were days where I'm like, you know, I don't know if there's going to be, who the hell knows what's going to happen. You know, are we, will the show ever get made? But, you know, I have no idea. Mm. You know, so there were days where just being motivated was hard, but then, you know, getting materials was tricky. And I was going to bring in some more people and then couldn't do that. And so myself and Dan Petrascu built the model. John Knoll did the wiring harness for us, but we built the model and it was a damn struggle and it wasn't done. We got to stage and it still wasn't done. And John, thank God, John was able to accommodate what we had. We did that sh first shot of it going over camera because it didn't have a top. <laughs> At that point, the model's upside down, there are wires hanging out of it. There's no top on it, you know, because I'm, I'm like taking it home and working on it at night. But, you know, we were able to make it work. But, and, and I said to John, this was something I thought was kind of funny. We're sitting out there and I was doing work on the model sort of between shots. And I said to John, I said, you know, I said, you know why we're here? He said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the reason we're both in California, he's from Michigan. I'm from North Carolina. And John and his brother, they wrote Photoshop. John's got an academy work for pirates. He was the soup on the, on the prequels. John has done so much stuff. But I said, the reason we're both here is because of exactly what we're doing right now. We wanted to shoot models of spaceships on stage. And that's what we're doing right now. So for me, as tough as this cruiser was, that is one of my favorite things was having, and having that moment with John too, where we're both, we're talking about that. And it's like, yeah, that is why we both wound up in California was to do exactly what we were doing on Mandalorian. So <laughs> long story. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Smithsonian's uh, National Air and Space Museum exhibits the original Star Trek um, studio model used to film the series from 66 to 69. How were you involved in the restoration work? Uh, we went with our colleague, Bill George, for weeks to help detail, uh, trick it out. Um, actually, it was taken from just base, base paint through to the end while we were there. There's, I think they did a little bit about a few odd smells left. But I think it, we were brought on partially because we had worked so much on Star Trek and um, it kind of lent a certain PR, you know, uh, certain PR charisma to restoring it. And it was the helmet, it's the fourth time it was restored, right? It's the fourth time it's been, because the Smithsonian received the model in 1974. Yep. And it, there were, there, this was the fourth restoration. And over the course of that, the only thing that didn't get changed was the top of the saucer. And the top of the saucer, had been weathered i think it was in season three i think it was this episode space seed the one with ricardo montalban which was it was the seed that turned into the wrath of khan but so that part hadn't been changed since season three but the rest of it had been completely repainted and there was a whole issue about whether it would have lighting or not and and that was a debate that went on for quite a while and they were hesitant to have lighting and the reason was years before the smithsonian had had a large exhibit of miniatures that had traveled around the country and one of those miniatures was the Mothership from Close Encounters. And it had a lot of neon inside of it. And at one point that was left on and it caught on fire. Oh. So there was damage to the model. It had to be restored. And Margaret Whiteycamp, who was over, she was overseeing the Enterprise Project, she said, I don't want one of my exhibits to catch on fire. 
And so we had a discussion one, I would, I would, I was on this consulting group for the enterprise a couple of years before we did the work. And I was back in DC at Christmas and she and I had a conversation that was probably two hours long about the lighting thing. And I was like, it's, it's low voltage. It's not going to catch on fire. It's going to be okay. And, but she really didn't want to do it. And we had, uh, Evan Atherton, who works over at Autodesk had replicated the sensor dish, the navigation dish, which had gone missing from the original. And so Gary Kerr, who was our consult on all this, all the enterprise stuff, he had a computer model of exactly what the dish was supposed to be. So Evan printed up a 3D printed version of that. And we, we were holding it up to the model and looking at it on the enterprise model. And in the course of doing that, we pulled off the front navigation deflector section and that just opened up the inside of the body. It's like a barrel, it's a wooden barrel type structure. And we put a light inside, we were looking at it and Margaret saw she was on she's on the side looking at it. She saw the light. She's, oh my God, it has to have lights. And I'm like, what have we been saying? It has to have lights. <laughs> so from that, the enterprise wound up getting its lights back. And so I think when it's on exhibit, it's on it's in storage right now because they're restoring the milestones of flight gallery. They're restoring the entire museum, but it's in phases. But when it's on exhibit, I think the lights come on three times a day for about 10 minutes at a time. So and you know, it was interesting too, working out the engines because the engines are kind of a product of both the lighting and, and the motors and stuff they had internally, but it's also a product of the frame rate at which they were shot. Because if you watch the footage, you'll notice that the, the interior of the engine is pinwheeling and doing stuff, that has to do with frame rate. And that's not something you can reproduce oh. in the whole world. So Bill George did a CG test and came up with 15 RPMs being the correct, correct approximation of what you're seeing on screen on average. And so, it was a question of averaging what we saw on screen and what we could build in reality. And that's what's in there. But, and that was Randy Newbert who did all the wiring or the, he created the programmed electronics that facilitated all that stuff. And then Dan Petrascu, the same guy who's been working with me on Mandalorian, Dan did the machining for these mounts that went in the engines that support all that stuff. So it's an interesting group project. <laughs> but anyway. Very cool. Yeah. Smithsonian had come up with a, a, a color for the for the base of the uh, of the enterprise and they actually hadn't really completed base coating the whole thing by the time we got there. So so they were hustling to finish parts of it while we were detailing other parts of it. So we were all hustling. That, we were was, all hustling. that, was, that was we were pushed right to the limit to get everything done. They were the long, period. exhausting days and all we had usually to eat were they, all they have in the Blue Barahazi is McDonald's. Oh. So every day. Was, we had to hustle up there before five o'clock because it closed and get our artisan chicken sandwich. I never saw the artisan making it in the back, but <laughs> we had our artisan chicken sandwich at five and then the, the museum would close. And it was really interesting. It took for the first week, I didn't realize I could get out of the hangar where the restoration happens. I thought we were locked in there. We had to have a card key to go to the bathroom. They oh. would have go to the bathroom with us and use their card key to let us in the bathroom. Well, after the first week, I figured I, I could get out of the room, but I couldn't get, get back, back in. in. <laughs> but I could at least get out of the room, you know? And it was funny because Margaret got locked out at one point. She's outside the hangar. Like trying popping to, up and down. Trying to jump up and down. Oh. She couldn't get back in. This is the curator of <laughs> milestones of space. Yeah. But at oh. night, it was interesting because we would walk out of there and there's a second floor walkway that goes through the center of the museum. And it kind of divides the museum into two halves. And to the left, as you're walking out, it's all military aircraft. And to the right, it's all general aviation and stuff. Well, the left side's a lot bigger than the right side is. And as you walked over, it was interesting. All the lights would be off, except it's a minimal lighting down low. But the Enola Gay, which is the B-29 that dropped the atomic mm -hmm. bomb on Hiroshima, mm -hmm. there was a light on in the cockpit of that. And it was kind of eerie every night to walk past that thing, mm -hmm. see this light glowing inside the cockpit. But I said to Bill George one night, we were walking across it, I said, you know, it's really interesting how on the left, there are all these military aircraft. On the right, there's a handful of general aviation. He goes, it's our tribal nature. And that really stuck with me. That's why there's so much military stuff and not as much general aviation yeah. stuff. But anyway. I'll explain one little thing, too, which we didn't say. Um, even though uh, the original series Enterprise is normally on display in the mall, in the Air and Space Museum on the mall, the restoration work was done out uh, at Udvar Hazy okay. in Chantilly, Virginia, because they have huge, they have a huge uh, restoration space for airplanes. And they have, I don't know how many 
spray booths, but we got one of the large spray booths that would accommodate probably a wing of an air of a large airplane. Um, that was what we used to where we used to paint. So how long is the model? They've got an X-wing fighter there right now. That's a full size one. That they're putting Restore. together. Yep. Yes, yeah, I'm looking okay. forward to when they when they put that on display next year. Yeah, that's a cool space. That whole thing it is. is really. I mean, they, they have great spray booths, on, and of course, it's great to have the for people in the museum. There's a catwalk where they can look down into the restoration area and see these historical airplanes being being restored and. They were people were hanging out waiting for glimpses of the original series enterprise because because it had been kept you know purposely kept under wraps but occasionally pieces would have to come out and, and into other smaller spray booths that were like in the center of the floor or hanging off of you know we'd have to hang some pieces in order to paint them or dry them or whatever so people would get little glimpses of parts of it <laughs> all along the way and um, how long is the model? 10 feet or 11 feet two inches long it's big okay. it's like it's like a station oh. wagon kind of yeah. it's that big yeah it's 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 quite something mm -hmm. we have a great photograph of it but i can't show it to you because it's on this computer so. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the downside with with digital photos now you don't have the physical copy anymore to to hold up to the the camera <laughs> i don't think i have a print of that Actually, but i should there's a, print, there's a print. There's a print of it right here. Oh, okay. It's interesting, you guys. The noise they are doing construction right outside the house. Yeah, they're doing work, road work, of course. Oh, yeah. I thought well, I heard the, the humming. Yeah. Or something. Well, this isn't it, but this is a shot of the Enterprise when, when they were stage. filming it. Okay. So that's that's back in the '60s. Um, there is a shot of it somewhere. There's one of the pictures. There's a there's a really cool shot that one of the conservators took of us with the. With the enterprise. Oh, come on. Wow. Yeah. So that gives you a sense of the that is massive. Of yeah. It's big. It's definitely big. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Um, so you had kind of touched on this um earlier before the uh, Smithsonian question. Um back in the early two thousands, uh you both had somewhat shifted more to like the digital aspect of the wheelhouse uh was would you find that was an exciting and a natural transition or was it a bit nervous making the change or it was it i know for myself i the writing was on the wall as far as trying to make a living making models or, and i was working actually we were both working on um peter pan and somebody called over to the stage for me and said are you interested in coming over to cg and because they needed more people on they needed uh texture painters on episode three and i said yes i just said yeah i mean this the transition from practical to computer graphics for me was about two minutes <laughs> because I like literally stepped off the stage into the training department at, at ILM and it was nerve wracking. It's a, it is a different way of thinking. And the first two weeks of training for me were just really energy sapping. But it is exciting to do something new and it has its own rewards doing computer graphics. And, you know, more recently I worked for Phil Tippett and um, extended my knowledge of the process of computer graphics and putting textures on a model and and making them look like what they're supposed to look like wood or look like glass or whatever we call it look development and uh, I'm doing fur and hair for digital models for, for me that was that was really exciting to do it was really a fun and interesting thing but it could be nerve-wracking I mean and you know it was, well, yeah. it was, it was not, it wasn't a natural transformation to me at all because I barely did email, <laughs> and, you know, so the, the thing they did, they gave us, I got a month's worth of training 
then they gave me the first thing I was going to paint was Luke's land speeder, which had been painted previously with a different paint system for special edition mm -hmm. episode yeah. four. And I didn't know how that system worked. And I was supposed to fix that and paint it with the new system. So that was the first thing. And, and it, I would say it was six months of, you know, people ask what was the learning curve. I'm like, the learning curve was vertical to me. Yeah, it was vertical. I dreamt and pulled down menus at night because it's just such a totally different change. But then interestingly, it eventually evolves to the point where it's a tool set. And although the, a lot of the technical stuff I wasn't interested in and didn't know how to do, but the general artistry of it, you're making a lot of the same choices. You know, when I was modeling, I started realizing I'm making some of the same choices here digitally that I would have done practically. And then on the paint, there are so many advantages you have in the digital world mm -hmm. that you don't have in the practical world. And it got to the point where we were doing a lot of material assigning. So you could tell something, okay, this is wood, this is, we, you know, I wanted something flat. So like a primer type surface, I might be using material yeah. called clay, yeah. but you know, it has those properties of kind of a matte finish. So I was painting the Y-wing on uh, Rogue One and the U-wing, and I would put a, a matte aluminum as my base coat. And then over that, I would put like a, the clay material, which would be the primer. And then over that, a semi-gloss paint and then I could chip away the semi-gloss paint, reveal some of that primer, and then reveal the metal. So that you got a very realistic looking scratch. And like the pipes and stuff that were on the on the Y-Wing, a lot of those they made copper. And I actually went back in and put solder joints and did color around the solder joints on the copper. You had this control in the digital realm that you don't have as much of in the practical. And you could do incredible stuff. And we were using a software called Mari at that point. And that was where, for me, it truly got to the point where, to me, it was like, this is like, this is like working on a real thing. And so that was where it really, after like 13, 12 or 13 years, it finally got to the point where it was like, okay, this I get. This is like working on real stuff. And that was really fun, that part of it. So there's another aspect of this that I know, I know at Tippett, they really appreciated. I mean, because Phil himself was, you know, famous practical Mahler, well, not Mahler, but, you know, he, he comes from the practical world and uh, they all seem to really appreciate people who have a practical background where many of the companies, the visual effects companies are populated by people who only have computer graphics background and no practical. But I kept getting feedback from people at Tippett who hadn't had, not everybody has, a very, actually very few people's even though it tends to be a little bit older crowd, um, many people did not have a practical background. Um, and I was constantly told how much they valued that. And I had people tell me they learned a lot from me. And, and, and it was mostly not because I could teach them anything about graphics, but because we had to study and make things in the real world and we were able to pass on knowledge about how things happen. I, I remember once at a different company, there was a, a texture painter who had to paint a, a plastic bag in its various stages of burning and she did not know how it looked. And I said, we're gonna go upstairs to the model shop, which it had, burn some plastic and you can see how it works. It's what she was doing did not did not work. It did not look like it. People think, well, how does plastic burn? Does it, you know, go up in cinders and ash? And then, of course, in this case, a plastic bag, it gathers up. It kind of contracts on itself and makes hard, you know. Anyway, we did this eye-opening thing for her. But we have this kind of background a lot of people don't have. In even watching how things move, how helicopters move, how airplanes move, how, how a group of helicopters or a group of airplanes move in the sky. We have that, that kind of, a little bit more of that kind of um, maybe observational experience than many people. Mm -hmm. So John, when you got the chance to go work on The Mandalorian, you know, you went back to physical, um, ship modeling apart from the cruiser and the razor crest are there other ships you you worked on that's the only things those are the only things that have happened so far mm -hmm. uh you know and there could be more uh but you know at this point there are other models that have been used on the show for sure Tippett has been doing stop motion work mm -hmm. we've done some really beautiful stuff for it and then there was the uh tie fighter junkyard 
that they showed in season two. And I saw the miniature for that, the reference miniature, and it was beautiful. And I'm not sure who did the work, but, and I think there have been other miniatures done as well for it. So there's, there's a lot of practical being incorporated in the Mandalorian. And then also their whole projected, you know, filming oh, system. Volumes. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. That, and that was, that is just incredible. You know, it's, it's really interesting how they are pushing the boundaries on how to do this sort of work. And, and, you know, they're, they're, they're embracing the old and they're embracing the new. They're kind of, it's the, it's the full range that's happening there, but yeah. I'd love to do more. We'll see what happens in the future. And I think there are a few people there who really try to promote that. Doug Chang does, Ifloni does, mm -hmm. uh, John Favreau. Mm -hmm. they, they like models and they have been advocates for for having them in Mandalorian. And speaking of the future, uh, what are you guys uh, working on right now? Can you share anything that isn't spoilery? <laughs> I just retired in February. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just the very end of February, and I am working in my studio. I'm, you know, doing my and sculpture and so on, and printmaking. Got my printmaking going. Yeah. So I'm a recent and and happy retiree. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing work with uh, with the academy, the Ampass Museum, which will open I think in September. So I've been working with them and been working with them on a number of things. Uh, the biggest one is probably the restoration of the Aries from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And so that's been interesting. We've been, we've been working on that for about five years now, I think. COVID kind of, obviously there was a giant gap in there. I haven't seen the model in like 13 months, but, uh, but we're really close to being finished with that. And some other work for them, some restoration work for Paramount on some of their Star Trek collection. And then potentially some more work on maybe some more of the Star Wars TV work. So odds and ends, but mostly it's all practical work at this point. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that some of the, like, even though they're not historical artifacts, you know, they're, they're fictional sci-fi artifacts. It's still nice that people are, you know, restoring them and keeping them nice for display pieces. Well, they, you know, the, the Aries is 52 or three years old now. <laughs> you know, the Enterprise is over 50 years old. I mean, yep. there, you know, and even the Star Wars collection. I was working on some of the Star Wars stuff January before last that was out on exhibit. And, you know, that stuff's 40 years old, you know, and it's some of it's starting to show its age. And it's interesting how these things that weren't built, they weren't built to last. They were right. built shot. And now they've become artifacts, which puts them in this whole other realm. Mm -hmm. And it's now it's about conservation and preservation and trying to either arrest deterioration or or repair it but it's interesting how they all they all they all have these issues that are different because the materials are different the ages are different mm -hmm. and then there comes the question of something like the aries or the enterprise where do you restore it to if you're going to do a restoration and the aries was interesting in that we weren't clear on some of the reference we had we had some beautiful color images of it that showed detail we'd never seen before and in talking to uh, some different people, we found out that was part of a restoration that happened after filming. So this was completely inaccurate. And but it's so you're it's it's interesting to have to do the research to kind of figure out where you're going to go. The Enterprise, like I said, the top of the saucer had been had only been last worked on in season three. So we wanted to restore the rest of the ship to to be in line in that timeline where the top of the saucer was. So. It's really interesting all the way around that they have become historic artifacts. They are museum pieces. And how do you preserve some of these things? And you know, some of them, some of them you can do you can do a lot for them. And some of them, some of the deterioration is just the materials just aren't designed to hold up and they're falling apart. So it's interesting. It's an interesting, it's an interesting arena to be in because it's there are a lot of unknowns right now trying to figure this out. And plastics in general are a real problem for the conservation museum world because no one's sure exactly what to do with a lot of them so it's, it's an evolving technology it's been pretty perplexing i think for the traditional con conservators that have been working with, on both uh, original series enterprise and the areas right yeah well i mean because, I've been, yeah, yeah i've been working with a, a conservator irena and i'll probably say her last name kalinescu but irena is she's a traditional con conservator and it was interesting they put us together 
because I'm not a conservator. I'm learning a lot of those, what, of what they do and, you know, I'm trying to adapt more of what I do kind of in the, in line with that. But it's really interesting. We both learned from each other throughout the project because, you know, how do you approach this? What do you do there? There isn't, there isn't conservation training for this right now. And it's, it's such a small little niche thing, but it, there will be more and more of this as time goes on. Yeah. So. George's museum is going to open when? 2023? I think so. And undoubtedly there'll be, you know, so it must have, I'm imagining there are going to be a lot of models in it. And so there's just going to be, that's just going to be an issue from now on. Yep. Bringing yeah. those things back. To they are historic artifacts at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you said, and they, I mean, John brought up that, um, that they weren't built to last. And, and one of the famous quotes in the model shop was you never build anything bigger than a dumpster <laughs> or something to be broken down in dumpster sized pieces. <laughs> so that was the, that's the mindset. Yeah. It's interesting. One of the things that's, that we're seeing is most of the stuff that's painted in the model shop, a lot of it used automotive paint, but then also we used a, an enamel paint that was called railroad color. And railroad color went through a couple of formulation changes, but essentially, it, it, as I understand it, it was an enamel, and that's what we've used for most things. And the reason we used it was because it wasn't very reflective, which was great for blue screen photography. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that paint is breaking down and turning into what looks like almost miniature cat litter. Oh. So it's coming off the surfaces and kind of crumbling into this almost like sand-like material. It's really strange, and mm -hmm. no one's sure exactly what's happening but and then there's weird pitting that happens in plastics too it's interesting because you're looking at plastics that are 40 40 and you know, 40 years and older some of the stuff and it's interesting to see what the degradation is and you know we i've shown a lot of pictures to different conservators and everybody's sort of puzzled by exactly what's happening but everybody is working towards how do you how do you at least stabilize this stuff so it's 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 interesting it's all it's all it's the bleeding edge right now of that conservation work I have to say that, you know, for myself in terms of retirement, I, I'm pretty stuck on retirement, but I think if a project, you know, maybe especially a collaborative project that was interesting enough came along, I would, you know, it'd be fun to work on occasionally my yeah. retirement years. Yeah, that, isn't that the best part of retirement? You can pick and choose what you want to do? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not looking forward to anything in particular, but you know, I think it could happen. I've had people ask me, and I pretty much right at the beginning, if you know, I put in my my time in the visual effects industry, and you know, I don't want to take anything away from from what I develop on my own, my own work. But I love I love the visual effects industry. I love models, so if I could be enticed occasionally. <laughs> Well, I'm open for business. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I think that was that was all of our questions. Um, so, and we, we've also our gotten to the hour mark. And they are doing road work out in front of our house, which has never happened before. And we didn't know they were going to do it today. So yeah, they're, they're tearing up the sidewalk. So <laughs> it's just like you're in a like a a movie studio with like construction going on in the next yeah. studio over yeah it's a fairly <laughs> consistent sound but it's yeah that's pretty loud <laughs> um so um thank you so much uh kim and john for joining us at the 501st legion social media event uh to support first and also celebrate 50 years of lucasfilm it's been really cool talking yeah. to you guys well something i want to say i want to say thank you very much because Ira Keeler passed away. Yes. Ira was one of the folks in the model. Right. Ira did the pattern work for a lot of the miniatures, did the pattern work for the biker scouts. Yes. And yes. a group of biker scouts came to Ira's funeral from yes. 500 first. And that was a, it was, it was a really, wonderful. it was a wonderful yeah. thing. It was a great tribute and it really made it something special. And I, I want to say thank you very much to the 500 yeah. first for doing that. Right. That was really great. It was I really remember. hot and none of them collapsed that we know of. So <laughs> I don't know how that, how oh. how you got it our troopers were, are pretty um, hardy well, i remember some our golden gate garrison yeah um, and they were really they, they were honored to take part in that well 
our thanks for that because it really it really it meant a lot to everybody i think it was a great yeah. tribute to ira yes thank you yeah it was our pleasure thank you again all right so erica if you're listening i think